Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner. I'm here today with my awesome dermatology and pathology residents, and we're going to do some unknown cases um, about uh, granulomatous disease. So this is case one. Who would like to, to take this? Good. This is foreign body granuloma, and you can actually see the foreign bodies right here. Yep. here and little tiny ones here and you know one clue from lower power for foreign bodies so you're, you're right you see this kind of ill-defined granulomatous stuff in here it's also a lot of sclerotic collagen and fibrosis which would go with scar as you would have when you had penetrating trauma uh, or injury to the skin which you know usually you need some sort of trauma to have a foreign body uh, get introduced to your skin unless it was like maybe injection or something where you know you, you know, inject you know crushed up pills or something else like that 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 can put foreign material in with minimal scar tissue. But one clue in addition to the scar is this. See these streaks? These are tearing artifacts uh, across the tissue. And I like to call this the Wolverine sign. It's like Wolverine took his adamantium claws and just slashed across the tissue. And it's a clue that there's little fragments of something hard in the tissue, either fragments of foreign material, calcium, bone, something, right? And that that is getting caught on the blade when the histologist, the histotechnologist is cutting the slide, and that's getting dragged across the slide along the blade or nicking the blade. I'm not sure which actually happens and, and dulling the blade. But in either case, I, I think it's that it drags mostly. And so it tears the tissue. So whenever you see that, these linear tearing artifacts in tissue, um, it's a clue to go and look uh, closely uh, for foreign material. So this, uh, the notes say that this is from silica, but um, in many cases we see foreign body granulomas and we don't ever find out the history of what the material was, which is always kind of disappointing because sometimes I'm like, ooh, this has such a unique look and then I never end up finding out uh, what the history was. But here's some more over on the other piece, lots of fragments. And of course, this is what, where uh, polarizing um, can come in handy. Uh, you don't need the polarize here, although it would probably light up pretty brightly. But using the polarizer can be helpful in a granulomatous process in the skin. I, I pretty much do it all the time when I see granulomas in the skin, unless I have some obvious reason for them. Uh, quickly polarizing the tissue, it's a quick way to look for little tiny fragments of foreign material. And sometimes they're very, very small. So um, here there's big chunks, but other times you'll get little tiny ones. So that's where you got to go look a little more closely and turn your light up bright on your polarizer. And of course, always remember to turn your light back down before you remove the polarizing lenses or you will blind yourself or it will feel like it at least. So um, in any case, foreign body granuloma. Good job, Rahil. Case two. Yeah, very good. This is a nice example of coccidioides imidis, um, or coxy as we like to call it, and something we basically never see in our practice here, um, but people who live in the Southwest where this is uh, endemic, uh, you know, my derm path friends there, so they see this several times a week, you know, whereas, and in my former job, I saw histoplasma regularly. Um, it just depends, you know, fungus sometimes is very geographic. But the coxy organisms are very large, right? Look how huge these guys are. And they have this like uh, thick kind of double layered appearing wall to the, um, the cyst. And then in the middle, they have tiny little endospores, which even this scan is not the best quality. But even when you have a nice section, I feel like seeing the individual endospores is difficult. Um, they actually just look like a bunch of little grainy kind of material in the center to my eyes, kind of a bluish gray. And sometimes these cysts rupture open and what you get is just the empty uh, cyst shell with none of the contents. So very large with a bluish center um, or empty shells. And I do think once you see these large ones, nothing else to my knowledge really looks like this, but sometimes they can vary in size a little bit. And when you see some of the smaller ones, they can have an appearance a little bit similar to blastomycosis. And both coxy and blasto, as well as a variety of other invasive fungal infections, um, can produce the pseudoepitheliomatous epidermal hyperplasia pattern with pus and granulomas, right? So looks almost like squamous cell carcinoma if you're having a bad day, right? It's, you know, really robust reactive epidermal change with some reactive atypia can mimic squamous cell carcinoma 
closely, but then the clues are finding the, the neutrophil pockets and the granulomas. Now, sometimes squamous cell carcinoma can have both of those things. So I've had multiple times, many times, seen cases where it was really difficult to decide for sure if something was reactive pseudoepithelioma to hyperplasia versus squamous cell carcinoma. And that's, I think, one of the more challenging differential diagnoses in dermatopathology. So when you find infectious organisms, well, then that helps solve the problem, okay? So this case is loaded. There's tons of organisms. They usually are going to either be in the giant cells or in the pockets of neutrophils sometimes. And also, occasionally, you'll see this. They get caught up into the epidermis. The epidermis is trying to kind of extrude them out, I guess. So you'll actually see them like floating in little pockets of of neutrophil aggregate or even within the epidermis itself. I think this one had one area like that, if I recall, when I was looking at it earlier. Um, well, it doesn't matter. So this is a real florid example, but you know, some cases of uh, infection, you really have to hunt around quite a bit to find the organism, do special stains uh, like GMS or PAS. Um, so it, this one though, you can see on H&E, all right? so. Um, the one clue, oh, I said blasto can sometimes look a little bit like this, although these are a lot bigger than blasto, but you know, when you get little ones like that, blasto, maybe a little touch smaller than that still, but blasto has a thick wall and has a kind of, uh, sometimes the cytoplasm in the center of the fungus can look kind of similar to the, this grainy material, the grainy spores inside the coxy. Um, so, uh, I think one thing that can help is if you see like obvious broad based budding, well, then you're not dealing probably with coxie. And like with most things, you know, there are features that tell us what this probably is histologically, but or, or microscopically, but really the, the gold standard way to identify the fungal species is by culture, or sometimes you can use molecular if needed, if you have that available. So, I mean, this one uh, is pretty good here. I think a lot of the yeast fungal organisms, you can often get pretty close to the answer based on their morphology. Hyphal fungal organisms are much more difficult, I think, to deal with on tissue sections, and uh, cultures are often needed, although there are some clues. All right, so coccidioides is a really great example of that. Okay, case three. Yeah, very good. This is like maybe the best example I've ever seen of NXG, necrobiotic xanthogranuloma. So at low power, massive infiltrate, and you can get the idea that either this is probably histiocytic infiltrate because you've got sheets of cells that are kind of pink. They have a lot of cytoplasm. And there's also zones of stuff that looks like necrosis or some material deposited from low power. So this, to me, when I look at low power, this is either a really rich histiocytic infiltrate or this is some sort of malignancy that's got necrosis, like an epithelioid sarcoma when I just glance from low power. But then when we go closer, you see, yeah, that's composed of histiocytes. Um, and uh, the, most of them are kind of epithelioid histiocytes, not a ton of lipid in them in, in many of the mononuclear cells. But then you have all these multinucleated giant cells, some of which look really weird and bizarre. Like they're kind of ring-shaped, you know, kind of Langhans or Teuton shape, uh, Teuton giant cells or foreign body looking giant cells, kind of a mixture of these. And they can look, the, the nuclei can overlap so much that they almost look like pleomorphism to me sometimes from low power. They look really prominent and bizarre. And they're intervened by necrobiosis, which is basically, to me, necrobiosis is a fancy way of saying necrotic collagen. Now, how do you know that collagen is necrotic? Well, collagen is not really like alive, right? I mean, it's extra um, cellular matrix protein. So to me, what helps me is that, you know, collagen is good if it's got living fibroblasts next to it. If you take those fibroblasts all away and just leave behind like wiped out collagen, and that's when I think of, oh, the collagen is kind of not living anymore, or it's degenerated because it is, you know, it doesn't have its normal living cells next to it. Now, I don't know if that's technically correct, but that's the way I kind of think of it, is that necrobiotic collagen begins to, to lose the normal fibroblasts next to it, and so it looks very pink and acellular, and then also it kind of gets distorted in its shape. And there's, you know, there is actual necrotic debris and stuff in here. So NXG has the, a similarity to granuloma annulare, right, where you have um, alternating kind of palisades of granulomatous histiocytes 
but with necrobiosis. So it has overlap with granuloma annulare or necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum, NLD. The difference is it looks like those things, but has these massive crazy looking giant cells. And then when we go down here, we have the other finding, which is cholesterol crystals, right? These clefts, cholesterol clefts. Now, one other thing that looks a lot like this is keratin granulomas. Keratin makes little cleft-like spaces, just like cholesterol does with a granulomatous response. And those can really be very challenging to tell apart. In keratin, you'll actually see the little flakes of keratin inside. But in, in reality, it can actually be uh, very challenging sometimes to tell because they both make these like very sharp, elongated um, uh, artifactual spaces with surrounding granulomatous response. So if you see something that looks like a really robust example of granuloma annulare or necrobiosis like poitica, and then you see these bizarre multinucleated giant cells and cholesterol uh, clefts, then you're probably dealing with necrobiotic xanthogranuloma. In, in my practice, quite rare. I only have seen a handful of cases. And it's usually associated with the monoclonal gammopathy. Often it's a kappa, um, um, I think IgG cap, if I recall. And uh, these patients may have underlying uh, myeloma, multiple myeloma. Sometimes they get NXG and then develop multiple myeloma much farther into the future, years later even. And occasionally it can be associated with a variety of other hematopoietic, um, you know, like lymphomas, Waldenstrom's microglobia anemia. It's been reported in association with a variety of other things uh, other than myeloma. But, but it's important to know that there is the systemic um, the potential for systemic uh, hematopoietic malignancy in these patients, and they should be worked up for that and followed up as well. All right. And XG. I think these make like reddish yellow plaques. Uh, the picture I usually see is where they show it near the eyes, but it can be also around the head and neck and also the trunk and proximal extremities sometimes as well. Yeah, very good. This is an eruptive xanthoma. So obviously the clinical history will be that there are numerous papules and they came up quickly. You know, they can arise within just a few days sometimes, I believe. Um, but you're right, microscopically, even without being told the clinical, we can be almost certain that this is an eruptive xanthoma because in addition to the foamy histiocytes kind of coursing through the collagen, there is also the background of this gooey, uh, whitish, bluish, um, a frothy material that's just floating there in pools. And that is the um, uh, uh, extracellular lipid, which is predominantly triglyceride. And these, these patients, uh, usually eruptive xanthomas are associated with hypertriglyceridemia. And so, you know, most xanthomas, the lipid content is predominantly cholesterol, but in eruptive xanthomas, the uh, lipid content is predominantly triglyceride and it tends to spill out of the cells. Now, the, um, that gives this kind of unique, somewhat palisaded appearance, which is a bit different than you see in a lot of other like xanthomas like, uh, or xanthalasma, where they're just kind of sheets of, of histiocytes that are foamy that all look the same. Here you've got these cells kind of that look like they're almost palisading a little bit like granuloma annulare. And you know, if you thought that this stuff was maybe kind of pale mucin, and then you could think GA because of, of this coursing kind of um, palisading and interstitial pattern of histiocytes. The other thing is that sometimes that you can get some uh, crystal-like structures that resemble monosodium urate crystals. I've never seen a case like that, but it's uh, um, in the McKee textbook, it talks about that, actually. I was just reading about that this morning. And, um, and it said that, you know, because of that, the palisading plus some crystalline structures, um, you could uh, confuse it with, uh, with gout, uh, actually. So good to keep those two things in your differential and recognize those. And also, of course, because of the, the potential for uh, systemic lipid abnormalities, it's important to check these patients' serum lipids and uh, make sure that they're appropriately managed for that. Okay, case five. Very good. This is a nice example of Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And, you know, one of the, the ways my mentor, Doug Parker, um, uh, in fellowship, said that it, Langerhans likes to fill up the papillary dermis. It's an infiltrate of histiocytes that fills the papillary dermis, and then it does not respect the boundary of the basement membrane. It infiltrates up into the epidermis. And that makes sense, right? Because Langerhans cells normally live in the spinous layer of the epidermis, and then they get some antigens and then they go down into the dermis and get into lymphatics and go to lymph nodes and do their antigen presenting work. So when you have this neoplasm of Langerhans cells, 
um, it has that ability to cross into the epidermis and the dermis. Now, we can't really see the cytology really well here, but um, I will show you an example uh, from a, a, another talk that I gave here that will help clarify, I think. So here's, uh, here's uh, one that where it's filling and infiltrating the epidermis. And so if you're having a bad day, you could, you know, get that confused with mycosis fungoides. You could think about, you know, even melanoma or something. I mean, with practice, no, this is, this looks like Langerhans cell, but I mean, it infiltrates the epidermis and the cells are kind of bigger and have some cytoplasm. Um, and so, yeah, you could think about, you know, if you looked at a close up area, you could think about pagetoid spread or epidermotropism or some other things. So I know when I first encountered this as a trainee, th those ideas crossed my mind. So important to recognize that. And then here's an example of another disease that fills the papillary dermis, mastocytosis. And the cells, they, they can look kind of similar from low power. As you look closer, you get the grooves and bean-shaped kind of cells in Langerhans, and you don't really see that in mast cells, but they can have some similarity. And the big difference is that mastocytosis very has a nice, clean respect for the epidermis. It stays right in the dermis and does not infiltrate the epidermis, whereas Langerhans cells usually does, all right? And then... Um, this is a closer look cytologically. You can see the bean-shaped nuclei, and depending on which way you look at them, they'll either look like beans or they'll look like little, have a linear groove, like a coffee bean. Uh, like here's one with kind of a groove right here. So it kind of depends. And then that's the stains that they'll stain with S100 protein. So uh, another reason, remember S100 stains melanocytes and also Langerhans cells. It's a reason that we, we do not use S100 to evaluate pagetoid spread in melanocytic lesions because it's going to stain those background Langerhans cells and confuse you. And then also CD1A will stain them and Langerin uh, CD207, uh, which can be helpful in sorting this out for, from some other mimics like indeterminate cell histiocytosis. All right. Langerhans. And of course, there's a variety of different forms of Langerhans cell histiocytosis, which we learn about in med school, and you can go and read all about those if you'd like. Okay, case six. Very good, yes. And so that this is indeed epithelioid sarcoma, and it can be very tricky, especially from low power, because at low power, it looks like a big palisaded granuloma, very similar in architecture sometimes to rheumatoid nodule. Now, it doesn't always do this, but this is a pretty good example of how it makes a ring of, of cells around the outside, and they're cells that have abundant cytoplasm, so they have a histiocytic kind of appearance, and then a big zone of pink, necrotic stuff in the middle, but that necrosis can look a lot like the fibrinoid necrobiosis or fibrinoid necrosis that you see in the center of a rheumatoid nodule. The key is as you go closer, the cells are on the outside. Usually, you can see they're usually much more cellular. They're bigger. They're more atypical. Now, atypia is kind of in the eye of the beholder. So it definitely, there are times where you might look and say, well, I think it's rheumatoid nodule, but I'm a little worried. And that's when you can go and resort to those stains just to make sure. If I have any doubt, I do the stains because it's a huge difference, right? These are very bad tumors. They occur in young adults, sometimes in kids. They tend to metastasize, you know, kind of you know, with like marching metastases up the arm that, you know, often arise on the distal extremity. And then, um, and then they'll send little satellite lesions uh, and they metastasize the lymph nodes and then distant mets. And the prognosis is not great. Many of these patients will, will die from their disease eventually. So it's a really terrible disease. It's quite rare. And so it's easy to miss because it's rare and it mimics rheumatoid nodule. So I always, in deep granuloma annulare or rheumatoid nodule, I always ask myself, could it be epithelioid sarcoma? I just make it a habit. And then I go look and I'm like, nah, there's not enough atypia. I think this is just fine. Um, do keep in mind that mitoses, which are going to be seen in this tumor, uh, you can also see mitoses in granuloma annulare and rheumatoid nodule like all the time. No, not a ton of them, but I mean, scattered mitosis, no problem there. So uh, it's really about the, the atypia and cellularity. Here, it's even like wrapping around nerves, so not good. And so, yeah, you can use keratin and EMA. 
and then INI1 or SMARC-B1, which is normally positive in the nuclei of most tumors and most normal cells in the body, is, is lost in the vast majority, uh, you know, close to all of uh, epithelioid sarcomas. And there are, uh, INI1, SMARC-B1, I'll point out, is not totally specific. There's a growing list of other neoplasms um, that can have INI1 loss as well. So we don't really have time to go into that, but just know that it's not totally, you have to put it together with the appearance and the clinical and then the INI1 loss, and that's how you get to the diagnosis. So important to know about epithelioid sarcoma, um, a really unfortunate um, and bad disease. And it's unfortunately pretty pale, but it's still a good example of it. Right, good. This is Rosei Dorfman disease, mm -hmm. which was first described in uh, lymph nodes as sinus histiocytosis with massive lymphadenopathy. I think it's important to remember that name, even though that name doesn't make any sense in the soft mm -hmm. tissue because there are no sinuses. Sinuses are a thing in lymph nodes. Um, but, but that's the, the proper name that it was given, but we all refer to it pretty much as Rosei Dorfman disease, but it's always good to know alternative names because you never know on an exam what, which name will get asked, you know? So it's good to know the other names of things. And yes, we have sheets of histiocytes with variable amounts of background fibrosis. Some cases can be very fibrotic actually. And then the individual histiocytes are really large nuclei. I'll show you a different picture in a second because these are not quite in focus. Mm -hmm. But this case is actually pretty nice because you can really see the histiocytes. They even have red cells in their cytoplasm, lymphocytes in their cytoplasm, sometimes plasma cells. There are almost always plasma cells in the background of Rosei Dorfman. There are many plasma cells here, see? Very common finding. And then usually you'll have yeah, very aggregates much that not as prominent in this example. Yeah, so, very much that yeah exactly. But, but uh, the, yeah. this one, even mm -hmm. though it's faded, you really can see the imperipolesis very nicely. I will tell you that imperipolesis is awesome when you see it, but I don't personally feel like I have to see a good example of it to make a diagnosis of Rosei Dorfman because sometimes it, it's, it's there. Like here, all of these lymphocytes are all sitting in histiocyte cytoplasm, but they're not quite the textbook picture. The textbook picture you want is to see those, the cells I just showed you, right, like this, where you can see the individual cell with the little um, uh, lymphocytes, lymphocytes in it. But here, everything you see here, is basically histiocyte. It's all a sheet of syncytial looking histiocytes merged together. So any lymphocytes sitting in here are residing in the cytoplasm of those histiocytes, but it's, it's hard to appreciate that at first. So, um, and there's some hemocytorin in the background of this one. So let me show you um, another example here, just to give you a, a different view. So this is kind of a, the classic low power when you get a nice stain is most of the time when I see these, they're a subcutaneous nodule on the trunk of like a, a young adult. And they often are clinically thought to be a cyst or something as many subcutaneous nodules are. They can occur in the dermis too, but I feel like most cases I see are actually subcutaneous. And here there's, there's those sheets of pale pink histiocytes, pink or gray, and then these blue um, nodules are lymphoid aggregates with plasma cells. So one of my fellows, Dr. Betsy Eulenhake, um, she always liked to say pink and blue, baby. So from 2X, once you get used to this, I look at that and say that's Rosei Dorfman disease until proven otherwise. Because it has this very distinct look of sheets of pink that's kind of effacing and filling in the fat of the subcutis, and then these aggregates of blue uh, lymphocytes. And here's the closer look where you can really see cytologically. Look at all those plasma cells, tons of them. And then this is what the nuclei of Rosei Dorfman should look like this. And this is really important because uh, people will see, you know, imperipolesis or something that looks like it and think instantly that that's diagnostic of Rosei Dorfman. You can have imperipolesis in juvenile xanthogranuloma. I've seen it in reactive processes. So lymphocytes and other cells sitting in a histiocyte cytoplasm is not 100% specific for Rosei Dorfman disease, okay? You want to see the nuclei have these giant, huge nuclei with really pale, washed out, uh, cleared chromatin and usually prominent central nucleoli. Okay, so um, that is a Rosa Dorfman. And there's another nice example of imperipolesis. And these will usually stay positive for S100. You don't always have to do that, but it's a helpful feature. And uh, it, it does help highlight the little vacuoles where the, uh, the white blood cells are residing, the, the little vacuoles of imperipolesis. 
in the, uh, the tumoral histiocytes. And people debated for a long time if this was reactive or neoplasm, but I think now people recognize that it's, it seems to be neoplastic because there are um, uh, various uh, tyrosine kinase mutations hmm. that seem to drive this disease. Good job. Right? Perfect. Yes, I love that you picked up on that. That's so helpful. Eyelid skin has a distinct look. It usually has a very pale, loose dermis. It usually has melanin pigment incontinence, at least most of the time I see it biopsied. And then also you'll often see kind of more prominent, like plump or even multinucleated spindle cells in the dermis. I don't really see them here. And I don't know if they're, oh, here, here's one. I don't know if they're um, uh, histocytes or fibroblasts. I'm not really sure, but you, but it's a distinct and un unusual feature that you tend to see in eyelid skin. And then if you're lucky, like you said, skeletal muscle that close to the surface. Good job. Excellent. So here's the yeah, and here we lesion. Can see, you know, so what do you think this is on the eyelid foamy skin? Foamy histiocytes, like aggregates of foamy histiocytes filling up the dermis, which makes me think of uh, xanthelasma in this case. Yeah, perfect. This is xanthelasma, a perfect example. Eyelid skin with sheets of foamy histiocytes. And usually there's a little bit of lymphocytes here, but usually very little fibrosis or reactive change, very little inflammation, just the histiocyte sheets that are nice and pale and foamy. You know, other, other types of xanthoma elsewhere in the body could have a similar look uh, to this, but when you're on the eyelid skin, it's xanthelasma, right? And uh, you could also, you know, you could have other things like balloon cell nevi can look kind of similar uh, to these, but, but usually in that you're going to see some stuff that looks like nevus, but this is pretty distinct. Once you see it, uh, that's really all that looks like this is the anthelasma. Good. Excellent. Necrobiosis lipoidica, or in the older days, necrobiosis lipoidica diabetic corum, NL or NLD. Perfect example and a really good punch that goes all the way to the subcutis, which is very helpful in this process and in others um, where you have, where being able to see the deep aspect can be really helpful. And you're right, the layer cake or the parfait pattern, whatever you like, the layers of histiocytes and necrobiotic collagen almost looks like sclerosis here. And it does give a very firm thickness to the dermis, which is why we get that squared off, very perfectly square or rectangular shaped punch biopsy. Other things you can see that in are other diseases where the dermis is very dense and filled, uh, like, you know, morphia, for example. But uh, yes, the, the layering of the histiocytes, necrobiosis, and then usually variable amounts of lymphocytes, sometimes forming lymphocyte aggregates, and also plasma cells are usually scattered in the midst of this. Um, so that is uh, what you're seeing. So it can have, because of the kind of palisading and these, these interstitial histiocytes, interstitial meaning, you know, they trickle between the reticular dermal collagen bundles, you know, that is very much like what you can see in granuloma annulari. So this is one where if you didn't have a big enough, deep enough biopsy, like if you just gave me this, that'd be f perfect for granuloma annulari to me. So the clinical information plus being able to see a deep enough biopsy are the the important features to, to be able to sort this out from GA. And I've occasionally had times where I said, this is a, necro, a palisading necrobiotic granuloma, and I don't know, it could be GA or it could be ne necrobiosis lipoidica. It depends on the, you know, the, the situation or what it looks like, depending on that. So there have been times where I wasn't sure, but this is a really nice, straightforward, classic example, I think. And usually these are on the, the anterior uh, tibial area of the shin and have a, um, a yellowish kind of, a firm atrophic uh, plaque um, uh, that is kind of expanding. And they do often occur in diabetics, but not always. So that's why the, the diabetic quorum part has been, you know, dropped mo in, in recent years. I think people don't really call it that as much anymore as they used to. Good work. Case 10. Um, good for two cat cells because they kind of have that like foamy ring around them. Good. Um, yeah, that's important. People always focus on the ring of nuclei for two tone cells, but often forget that there should be a second ring, a ring of nuclei, and then a rim of foamy, you know, kind of a foamy candy shell around the outside and a smooth pink, uh -huh. uh, you know, creamy center, I guess, if it were like a little candy. I could uh -huh. see, I, I should add that and then sell it to 
to Mars yeah, you know, or one of those Nestle, somebody like that. I think it could be a thing, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. If, if this derm path thing doesn't yeah. work out, maybe. And, um, that. All right. So, yes, two ton giant cells. CO2 Tons of them. Very good. Yeah. And that is what this is. This is a solitary xanthogranuloma, also known as juvenile xanthogranuloma or JXG. Um, I still like to use, I use both names usually, although they do occur sometimes in adults, which is why, you know, maybe juvenile is not the, the most perfect term, but they are most common in children. And they tend to be kind of reddish brown t with a yellowish tinge to them because of all the lipid content that they have. And the, when the, this is a nice classic one where you've got tons of two-ton giant cells, many eosinophils, which is a classic binding, and then histiocytes and various inflammatory cells. But they can really run a range. They can be much, much more fibrotic than this and kind of start looking like dermatofibroma. They can also be much, uh, much more mononuclear with only rare Teutons and rare EOs. And then those can look kind of like a reticulohistiocytoma or other histiocytic processes. So it's, um, it, they can sometimes be a little tricky. And you can have ones again where they get a little kind of in periapolesis and can kind of start to resemble Rosai Dorfman disease a little bit. So um, I think for testing purposes, especially, uh, if you see a histiocytic process with two-ton giant cells and EOs, the answer to pick is xanthogranuloma. In real life, it is not always quite so cut and dry. There are times where it can be a little tricky. Here's one where you can just see it's filling up the dermis like we had in the other. There's those two-ton giant cells. So beautiful, aren't they? Very photogenic. And then, you know, all the EOs. Uh, but this one, look at this. This is a very early JXG. And I apologize, it's a little bit grainy from this picture, but um, this is one where, look, it doesn't have any two-ton giant cells here, and the cells look almost foamy a little bit. And, you know, you really could think of other things. You could you could think of other types of xanthoma. Um, you could think, uh, I mean, when I first saw this case, I remember I thought a little of mastocytosis um, because they kind of had a little bit of that mast cell look. And they have scattered EOs, but mastocytosis can have EOs with it too. So this is early JXG, so just it, it doesn't look the same when, when they first start out. They can be more of that mononuclear cell without any two-ton giant cells, and those can be more tricky to diagnose. So I think that's a little bit more advanced, but just so that you know that, it, that they don't always look textbook like this. But this one is a nice textbook example, juvenile xanthogranuloma. Yeah, very good. This is a really nice, great example of granuloma annulare, or GA, and it's got the palisades of histiocytes, which are nice, you know, they're kind of forming a line, like a, like a little picket fence around the edge, and then degenerated collagen or necrobiosis, and then mucin, right, or mixoid, uh, to pathology trained folks, we tend to call this hyaluronic acid, right, the blue gooey stuff. And um, remember uh, that um, on H and E, this the I find that H and E slides the mucin, um, the pale blue, it fades very quickly on slides. Like in my study set, it's one of the first things to go. So if you're looking at a slide that's even a couple years old, a lot of times you'll be like, "Where's the mucin?" And it just it kind of disappears. So it can be very subtle. Um, and uh, this is nice palisading. And then also in addition, the palisading is not always going to look so perfect as this. Okay, sometimes you're going to have to hallucinate it. The other thing is that away from the palisades, the histiocytes do this. They trickle between the dermal collagen. So this is called the interstitial pattern. And sometimes when that's all you can see, people call it interstitial granuloma annulare. It's really, to me, the same disease. It's just a matter of kind of the pattern and also what area you're sampling. Additionally, you can have perivascular lymphocytes. As with many different sorts of uh, processes, lymphocytes are present. And I, I've often seen scattered eosinophils in the background of GA, and that's been published in the literature as a finding that you can have. Um, and then uh, over here, I think you can see really nicely too the look at that mucin surrounded by palisades of histiocytes. Perfect example, granuloma annulare. And then uh, I don't think we have them in today's material, but just so you're aware of it, there are some other types of uh, uh, palisading necrobiotic granulomas. Um, two of them in particular, which are kind of related to each other, are called palisated neutrophilic and granulomatous, granulomatous dermatitis, PNGD. And interstitial granulomatous dermatitis, uh, PNGD will look kind of like GA, but has some neutrophils scattered in it. 
And then IgD looks kind of like this, but it tends to kind of wrap around individual collagen fibers and make them look like they're floating. But those two diseases are important to know because they look kind of like G or a lot like GA, but they're often associated with systemic processes. They can be re a reaction to drugs. Um, they can be uh, related to rheumatoid arthritis or, or connective tissue diseases, I believe, other systemic um, autoimmune processes. They can sometimes be affiliated with internal malignancy. So it's an important thing to know about because it may mean that some, the patient has something going on systemically. Uh, so if you see something that looks kind of like GA but has neutrophils or these funny collagen fibers or it's clinically kind of weird, then think about that other um, those other two diseases. And uh, some people have lumped those together under the term reactive granulomatous dermatitis. But just know that they're in the differential with uh, GA. And also, um, I have occasionally seen metastatic breast carcinoma in skin that very closely resemble GA, particularly interstitial GA. So just uh, if you have any doubt for that, you know, do a keratin. Um, but just know that that can happen. I've got a, a good example of that, but I don't think we have time to show it. So we'll have to skip that for today. Yeah, very good. This is, this is the interstitial pattern of granuloma annulari histiocytes trickling between or intercalating between the reticular dermal collagen bundles, right? And like I just showed you in that last case, this is, I think, really, I feel like most cases I've seen of interstitial GA just represent that either the biopsy was right at the edge of the lesion or we didn't cut deep enough. I, maybe there are some cases that only have this in the patient's whole body, but I feel like this is really just kind of the pattern that you see as GA trickles out towards the edge, okay? So um, that's, it's good when you see that, try cutting deeper, you know, if you're not sure, um, if, or if, it, you know, this one, usually once I see that and they clinically said that it looks like, you know, you know, uh, annular kind of firm uh, lesions on the dorsal hand or something that's classic for granulum annulare, then I think we're, we're done. Um, but in any case, just know that other things can look a little bit like this. Like I said, metastatic breast carcinoma can sometimes uh, have this sort of pattern, but it's going to usually be much more atypical. But, um, uh, you know, it can be subtle sometimes. And then the other thing is that, uh, that I've occasionally seen people get confused with is this it looks like collagen trapping, right? So at the periphery of a dermatofibroma, you see collagen trapping. And the collagen trapping at the edge of a dermatofibroma um, or the similar collagen trapping you can see at the edge of a hypopigmented blue nevus, for example, those two things can have similarity to this pattern, the interstitial pattern of granuloma annulare. Now, in practical real life, when you have the clinical information, almost never would you have confusion with that. But I have occasionally, when quizzing uh, junior residents, seen people get those confused. And so I thought, well, I should bring that up. So I learned a lot, actually, from how I see um, new learners approach cases and the things that they get confused. Sometimes they get things confused that have, are not classically taught as being mimics of each other, or at least I didn't learn them that way. And so then I think, oh, well, I better start, you know, making sure my, my other trainees know that those can kind of look alike. The other thing is you can see this pattern um, is lichen sclerosis, particularly extragenital lichen sclerosis, often below the zone of sclerotic collagen you'll see a little band of not only lymphocytes, but also of histiocytes that are trickling between collagen and look a lot like this interstitial granuloma annulare pattern. We, we published a paper about that, um, uh, I think it was this year, last year, I can't remember, not long ago. So in any case, just so you know that. This is, yeah, reticulohistiocytoma or reticulohistiocytosis. Uh, I think I got a picture of this too. That shows the, really nicely the, the cytoplasm. So there's the clinical. Um, you guys, if you're watching this online, you can pause to read that. It, if they're multiple, it's important to know uh, because they are often associated with um, serious systemic problems. They can have destructive arthropathy in the fingers, internal malignancy, uh, big problem. But when they're solitary, um, they don't have those associations. So they've been known as a reticular histiocytoma or a solitary epithelioid histiocytoma, whichever you like. But the cells are enormous, huge, massive. 
histiocytes. I mean, really kind of scary looking if you ask me. I mean, if you looked at those individual cytology, you could think of a of a Spitz nevus, or you could think of a melanoma cell or a carcinoma based on the individual cells. Now, when you look at them all spread out and kind of not clumping together into nests, but just evenly distributed with a lot of inflammatory cells in the background, I mean, that's the classic look of reticular histiocytoma, but I would not fault someone for doing a S100 or a keratin, or I mean, a SOX10 or a keratin here, just to make sure they weren't missing something else because they can look pretty wild, right? Look at that. And then here's the, um, the cells closer up. And here's the, the two-tone, not to be confused with two-ton, but two-toned, two-color cytoplasm. You've got this kind of darker purple areas and then a lighter pale pink area. And you don't always see this, but, but it's, it's usually present, at least in some of the big histiocytes, that they have a kind of darker color and then a lighter color that they kind of fade out into. And that's the very characteristic um, appearance. I mean, the nuclei look, I mean, that looks a lot like a Rosai Dorfman nucleus to me. I mean, cytologically it does. But here, the, the overall appearance is otherwise different. So that's a reticular histiocytoma, quite rare in my experience. I, I rarely encounter these in practice, um, but always on the lookout. And they can have uh, eosinophils, and they can have Teuton multinucleated giant cells. So because of that, they overlap a good bit with juvenile xanthogranuloma, I think. Even though they seem to be, I think, different diseases biologically, they morphologically on, on H&E oftentimes have a good bit of an overlap to me. So I think if you if you struggle to tell those apart, um, you're, I do too sometimes. I think the big thing is that in reticular histiocytoma, you should have these massive, big histiocytes and the two-toned purple to pink cytoplasm. And then, so on a test, if you see big cells like this, pick reticular histiocytoma. If you see two-ton giant cells and eosinophils, pick JXG. But just know that in real life, you can have eos and um, multinucleated giant cells present in reticular histiocytoma sometimes. Very good. Yeah, these are classic example of sarcoidal granulomas. They are very tight granulomas, right? The histiocytes are packed closely together and very sharply circumscribed. They're wrapped by a little bit of fibrosis here, and they may have scattered multinucleated giant cells, but very little inflammatory infiltrate otherwise, right? You don't, you're not seeing pockets of neutrophils. Usually it's relatively sparse lymphocytes. Um, you can sometimes have a bit more than this, but, you know, that's the classic, the classic naked tight granuloma is what you see in sarcoidosis. There are other diseases that can have sarcoidal granulomas, including, um, you know, uh, mycobacterial infections sometimes have sarcoidal granulomas. You can also see it in foreign body um, uh, reactions can look sarcoidal sometimes. So as you guys know, sarcoidosis is a diagnosis of exclusion. We do have to rule out infection and other things here. But when you've ruled out other causes and this fits clinically, then this is, this is a very classy example of what sarcoidosis uh, looks like. And I, I think it is sometimes hard to prove definitively that, that diagnosis. But what we can do is I can, I, I would sign this out as sarcoidal granuloma dermatitis or sarcoidal granulomas in the subcutis and dermis. And with a, you know, comment that we, you know, the stains are negative and this could fit with sarcoid if, if other um, things have been excluded. So good job. Right, so in this case, there is mucin here, which they, I don't know who makes this rule, but people say, you know, usually deep granuloma annulare is a blue granuloma, right? It has mucin in it, and rheumatoid nodule is a red granuloma. It has red fibrin in the middle of it. But in reality, it's not always so clear cut. You can have fibrin in GA sometimes, and sometimes, even though I think people say you're not supposed to, but I feel like you can see what fits clinically for rheumatoid nodule that does have some mucin. And here, look, you can tell there we're, we've got Pacini and corpuscles here. Oh, beautiful. So pretty. And so we're probably like on the hand or the foot, and we're down deep because over here you can see tendon or fascia or ligament, hopefully not ligament, but, but or tendon sheath, right? Dense regular connective tissue running in bundles. That's not smooth muscle here. This is, this is dense regular connective tissue with fibroblasts, okay? Um, and see, it's got the ramen noodle sign, the really wavy, crinkly look to it. 
like ramen noodles look like when you take them out of the package. And I've got a video about that you can go check out if you want. And uh, so anyway, this is uh, uh, was called rheumatoid nodule, and I think it fits for it, it looks like. Um, sometimes you can see uh, lymphoid aggregates and plasma cells in the background. You can sometimes see vasculitis around it, as you can see that in association with rheumatoid arthritis. I will quickly pull up another example, though, that I have that's much more classic. So this is like the one that you need to memorize. Like that, that's the classic, right? Really sharp palisading. Look at that palisading. Oh my gosh, it's amazing, right? Just completely forming this like perfect layer around and in the middle, bright red fiber. But look, still a little bit of bluish mucin in there too. And you know, we always say granulomas with neutrophils always think infection, but I, I think probably almost every rheumatoid nodule I see, you have some scattered neutrophils and a little bit of nuclear debris. You know, um, and like I said, you can even have vasculitis uh, next to it sometimes. Um, and so in any case, this is a really good classic example of rheumatoid nodule with that really bright brick red fibrinoid necrosis. It's like necrosis with fibrin like spilled into it, kind of mixed together. So it gives you that really reddish uh, granuloma appearance from low power. And in contrast, here's a nice uh, granuloma annulare that was going down deep and it has the palisading and really nice blue mucin in there, right? Really good blue granuloma appearance. I mean, wow, you don't get much more blue than that. That's perfect. So um, that's the look there. And you know, deep GA is usually like in kids um, or, or maybe young adults. And then rheumatoid nodule, you know, uncommon in children, right? Usually in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And usually I, I rarely ever see rheumatoid nodule in kids. I don't, kids can of course get rheumatoid arthritis, but I don't know if maybe they get rheumatoid nodules and they just don't get biopsied. I'm not sure. I'll have to do some reading about that. Um, and oh, one other thing I'd point out is that, that we always teach that rheumatoid nodules are deep, but I've seen many examples that come all the way up in the dermis, even all the way to like right below the epidermis. So uh, don't expect that every single one's going to be deep down like this, but there you go. Okay, good work. Well, you know what I'll do, guys, since we're, since we're short on time and I want to make sure I give you the answers. Do you want me to just go through and uh, tell you the rest of them and we're explain briefly? We're all filled briefly? with so much joy this morning, Dr. Gardner. Don't I don't worry. want to deprive you of the joy, <laughs> but I figure that'll be a little faster. So, and we're since all we're... filled with so much joy this morning, Dr. Gardner. Don't thank worry. You. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that part in the video. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So here we've got skin or weight. Do we? It actually looks kind of like skin, but it's kind of pale at the top and there's not really a good stratum corneum, right? It kind of just like the corneal layer is missing. So that's a good sign you're probably dealing with mucosa or skin that's right next to mucosa. And in this case, this is the lip, the lip of the mouth. <clears throat> and then um, as opposed like to the genital labia. And then here there's a little skeletal muscle as you would also see um, in the lip if you're in the, the vermilion zone or the, the mucosal zone of the lip, okay? And then here we've got a bunch of histiocytes kind of coursing between the collagen, a little similar to what we saw like in granuloma annulare. And here's a ton of mucin, way more. It's a little hard to see because there's so much of it, uh, but this is all a sea of mucin here, okay? So way more mucin than we would normally see in a, in a granuloma annulare. And then down here, we have like a pocket that used to have mucin in it and is surrounded by a palisaded layer of granuloma to cell, or histiocytes, making kind of a layer of granuloma. <clears throat> so this is what we call a mucosyl or mucus extravasation phenomenon. Um, the idea is in that, oh look, sweet, we got them. These are minor salivary glands, right? They're little mucin, little goblet cells in little clusters, making a mucus secretion that will secrete out into the oral cavity. This is the little tiny salivary glands that are inside the mucosa of the lip and, and all over in the mouth, not the major salivary glands, but the little minor ones. And so what happens is one of the ducts gets blocked um, either by, by a, <clears throat> a stone, a sialolith, or something else. Um, I don't know if trauma causes it or what, but this, the duct gets blocked and filled up with mucus, and then it ruptures, and all of that mucus spills out, and then you get this robust granulomatous reactive response. So some, if you're lucky, you'll see the background uh, little minor salivary glands. Sometimes you'll actually even see the duct itself. Um, with that's being ruptured, but other times all you'll get is just uh, this kind of wall of palisaded histiocytes around an artifactual um, space, kind of a pseudocyst, and then mucin spilled out into the uh, the the dermis slash submucosa. Okay, so the key is if you see mucus in this and it's on the lip, then it's going to be a mucosyl. All right, seventeen. 
In this one, we've got a ton of skeletal muscle. And we've got this structure. This looks like a sebaceous gland, but it's like a really long one. So this is a mabomian gland. And that looks like Cookie Monster or something right there, doesn't it? So there's his eyes and there's his mouth. And he's looking at a cookie up here. Cool. I think that's going to have to be on, on Twitter at some point. So mabomian glands are basically like just massively elongated sebaceous glands um, that are on the eyelid, right? And they their lipid secretion there is, my understanding is that one of its functions is actually to coat the surface of the eye to help pre prevent your um, your tears or your the, the um, aqueous layer of tears from drying out because it's coated with lipid. That's what someone's told me. I'm not an ophthalmologist, but I thought that was pretty cool. Um, uh, idea. So what happens is when the mabomian gland ruptures and the, the sebum and keratin material both spill out into the surrounding area, you get this massive granulomatous response and inflammation. And so this is a chalazion, right? A chalazion is a ruptured, inflamed mabomian uh, gland. And that's what you can see. And um, it is important to be careful because sometimes sebaceous carcinomas can uh, potentially, you know, present similar to chalazion. At least one of my ophthalmic pathology uh, mentors had told me that and to always look carefully and make sure that everything you're seeing is just reactive. And, you know, you could see sebocytes and then brisk reactive changes. You don't want to overinterpret that as malignancy, but you also um, don't want to miss, you know, hiding carcinoma in the background. I've not personally encountered one that I thought was challenging to tell those apart, but I've heard that it can happen. So just so you're aware of it. But this looks good for uh, chalazion here. And see, we get like granulomas, fibrosis, granulation tissue, and little pockets of neutrophils in this one. And oh, up here is a little touch of conjunctiva. Just a bit of it. It's not very happy conjunctiva, but that's what it is. 18. So this is a perianal polyp. And it was probably removed by a surgeon, because you can tell there's a bunch of cautery artifact here. And most of the derms I work with do not remove things with cautery, but a lot of times surgeons do. So it's, it's cheating a little bit, but you can sometimes look at things like that in the specimen and get some clues as to who might have re removed it. See the streamy nuclei? That's cautery artifact. So in this perianal tag-like polypoid area of skin, we have many granulomas. And they look a little bit like those sarcoid granulomas that we saw, except that they've got a ton of inflammation around them. There's a lot of plasma cells, lymphocytes, sometimes you can see neutrophils with them. So anytime I see granulomas in the anogenital skin, especially like these little small cluster granulomas with a lot of inflammation, I always think about the possibility of cutaneous involvement by Crohn's disease, okay? So um, a lot of times you'll check into it and then you'll find out, oh yeah, the patient has known Crohn's. But if they don't, it's important to make sure that, that they're potentially worked up for that if they, you know, have, you know, a review of systems and if needed colonoscopy. Um, the same thing kind of goes for if you see granulomas uh, of the lips, like you can see in Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome, right, where you get granulomatous infiltrate in the the lips of the mouth. Um, you know, because Crohn's presents with uh, has granulomatous infiltrate in the GI tract, but that includes the ends of the GI tract, the oral uh, cap mucosa and the anal and perianal um, mucosa and perianal skin. So always keep that in mind. So I've seen it involve like skin tags, incidentally, of the, the perianal area, but also in patients that unfortunately Crohn's sometimes produce, produces fissures and fistulas um, near the anus. And so you can get kind of polyps that arise because of granulation tissue and scarring from these repeated, you know, episodes of, of fistulas. And so this is a, a really good example, I think, actually, of, of cutaneous uh, Crohn's. So be on the lookout for that, and there's some giant cells with it. Um, I think there's a lot of granulomas here, but I've seen some where they were just kind of sparse granulomas and not nearly as many. So it's worth, worth raising that possibility when you see this. Okay, case 19. I'm going to just skip past this because I've got a way better one. And I mean, not trying to brag, but Told you. This is like the best one ever. Big polyp. This was from like the scrotum in this case, I think. And um, it has a kind of a, a polypoid appearance with multiple like papillomatous uh, surface, kind of a warty surface. So you could see clinically this could resemble a condyloma. Microscopically, though, not so much, right? Because what you have is the, um, if you look at these papillary structures, 
they um, they have a unique thing going on here. They've got this bright, bright pink red um, keratin, and there it's parakeratosis, and it directly it's like directly transitions. The keratinocytes turn like immediately into this dense pink parakeratosis, often with neutrophils scattered in there. And so it gives you the appearance at low power of kind of a wart that's set on fire. See, it's like bright red all over the top of it. And then when we go down and look in the papillary dermis, we can see, this is the highest I can go on this one, but there, there's foam cells, foamy xanthoma cells filling the papillary dermis. So this appearance with the foam cells here, the papillomatous surface with that really characteristic bright um, uh, parakeratosis, that's good for verruciform xanthoma, which is a benign lesion. And we, we think that the that it's a, this is a reactive process actually, and is not associated with any serum lipid abnormalities. So even though it has the xanthoma cells. So that's a nice verruciform xanthoma, and you don't want to confuse it with condyloma. And the other thing you don't want to confuse is I sometimes you can have a similar pattern of that parakeratosis pattern can also be seen in verrucous carcinoma, which also occurs in the anal genital area. So just know about uh, that, and, and that's a conversation for a different day, much more complicated. But I, I have seen cases where verrucous carcinoma at superficial biopsy looked a lot like verruciform xanthoma. So uh, this is a really... A nice benign and beautiful lesion. Uh, they, they occur in the um, in the oral cavity and also in the anal genital area. See, same same pattern of keratin right here, but that one was just so much more dramatic. All right, case twenty. This is here's a, a dilated hair follicle and it's kind of ruptured, and then around it is a granulomatous response with kind of necrobiotic center. So it's kind of a necrobiotic looking granuloma, palisading a little bit, and it's associated with this dilated and ruptured hair follicle. So in the right clinical context, this is on the face maybe, uh, this could fit, this was labeled in the study set as lupus miliaris disseminata fasciae, which is a very long name, and in the past, some people thought that this was a form of like tuberculid, that, you know, people that had tuberculosis got this as a secondary reactive granulomatous process. Now that's not thought to be the case. Um, this is um, other people, and, and the way I was always taught is that this basically is a variant of granulomatous rosacea, that, um, that it's a rosacea that just develops rupture of follicles and prominent granulomas. But not everyone believes that. And so there have been different names. This, um, a, um, you think, acne agmanata, I believe, is generally thought to represent the same thing as this. And some people recently have uh, come up with a different name, I think, called figure. It's like facial idiopathic granuloma, something, something. I, I meant to write it down. But in any case, um, so there have been debate and different names over this. But just know if you see papules on the face, and, um, and then you see granulomas plus uh, dilated follicles and perifollicular lymphocytes. You can think about granulomatous rosacea, lupus miliaris disseminata fasciae, and related spectrum of entities, okay? And you can go do your own reading on this to learn more about it. Um, but it is one of the, the multiple things called lupus that has nothing to do with lupus erythematosus. Case 21. See, I've not looked at this yet. This is, oh, this is a simple one. This is just a ruptured cyst. So here's your cyst lining. It's a, a follicular cyst infundibular type or epidermoid cyst, or pathologists sometimes call these epidermal inclusion cysts, um, and surgeons like to call them sebaceous cysts, even though they are definitely not sebaceous. And here's the keratin flakes, the little fragments of keratin cyst contents. And all of this here is a robust keratin granuloma with little keratin flakes embedded in it. And you can see variable amounts of granulation tissue, um, neutrophil, abscesses, scar, depending on uh, how often the cyst has ruptured in the past and how long it's been since its rupture. So that's a good example of a ruptured cyst with a uh, prominent granulo keratin granuloma response. And this is case 22. And here we've got a scar. Look, a scar from the surface that goes straight down. Not a very big scar. This is normal over here. This is normal. So this was probably like a punch biopsy scar or maybe a little incision that was approximated and pulled together, which means there should be a suture. And there's the suture, okay? So the suture is right here and there's granuloma around it. And in all honesty, this almost looks like the, the fibers of gauze more than suture, but given where it is, I suspect that it probably 
was some sort of, I don't know, it's marked the suture granuloma here, but really the, these little kind of like donuts that are squished, um, oftentimes like the little cotton fibers from, from gauze, you'll see little focal ones in there, but these are all clustered together. So, but in any case, this is some material that was either either put in a suture or that was contaminated the area during the surgery is normal to have this happen in any surgery. And so when you see a foreign body giant cell reaction with these little fibers in it, that tells you the patient probably has had a surgical procedure here before, which can be really helpful sometimes because we're not always given that history and maybe it was done at an outside facility and we don't have the pathology findings. And so sometimes going and tracking down that old pathology can actually help us to solve the case. And many, many times that's happened. So recognizing things that tell us that a previous procedure was done is actually more than just a you know, passing curiosity. It can really be important sometimes. And of course, these things usually polarize pretty nicely. And there's a variety of different types of suture. Um, and so, you know, they all, all look a little different and other types of fibers. So, foreign body granuloma and scar. And this, numerous granulomas. And they look quite tight and sarcoidal, like naked granulomas with very little inflammation, a little bit of sp sprinkled uh, lymphocytes. But then, what's this? It's black. It's not melanin because melanin is brown, not black. The human body does not make black. Black is exogenous, outside the body, foreign material. So in this case, it's tattoo, okay? But also carbon, like in our lungs, metal, like amalgam or silver. All of those things will be black microscopically. So this is a tattoo that got an area of swelling in it and then was biopsied and shown to have big sarcoidal granulomas. So this, this scenario we see not, not infrequently. The question that always comes up is, is this a granulomatous reaction to the tattoo or is this sarcoidosis secondary involving, uh, secondarily involving a tattoo as kind of a form of, of kebnerization, right? Where, you know, an inflammatory process presents or spreads to a site of trauma or injury. And so in my experience, I tend to think that usually when I see sarcoidal granulomas in a tattoo, that more likely this is a patient that probably has sarcoidosis that is secondarily involving the tattoo rather than a true tattoo reaction. It does kind of depend on though, when the, the, when the tattoo is done and when the response happened and if the patient has other signs or symptoms of sarcoidosis. So I usually send this out as sarcoidal granulomas with tattoo pigment and then bring up that I'm not totally sure which. But I feel like most of the time when I've seen tattoo reactions, they tend to be lymphocyte driven, not granulomatous actually. So they, uh, it, which is kind of surprising. You'd think oh, it's foreign material, it should make granulomas. But I feel like I usually see the kind of pseudo lymphomatous or perivascular lymphohistiocytic infiltrate um, in tattoo reactions with EOs and variable other stuff. Not as much clean sarcoidal granulomas. But I think... At the minimum, if you see this, you should consider that the patient may have sarcoidosis and, and do a workup to at least try to exclude that. And then case 24. This is a biopsy site here, right? The skin's depressed. There's some early oh, scar, yeah. granulation tissue, yeah, early scar tissue right there. And then right down at the bottom of it, at the bottom of this punch biopsy, what is this stuff? You can answer. Yeah, gel foam, right? Once you've seen it, you'll recognize it anywhere. These bizarre, weird, stretched out triangle structures. And this is gel foam. And probably this was a punch biopsy. And a lot of times, you know, I think, uh, as you guys know, punch biopsies you can pack with gel foam at the biopsy site to stop the bleeding. And um, I've, I know that a lot of people like to use that technique. And you also can see gel foam. In pathologists, we see this, you know, uh, plenty in, in other parts of the body. But in the skin, uh, it's something that you don't encounter often unless you're seeing something removed after a punch biopsy with, with gel foam. So that's what gel foam looks like. And once, you, once you've seen it, you'll know. But otherwise, the first time you'll be like, what on earth is going on here? And that's like much of pathology, right? And then finally, the last case, 25. This is a massive multi-nodular proliferation. You could see that this thing protruded way up above the skin and the dermis way pushed down towards the bottom here is filled with sheets and sheets of Xanthoma cells, foamy histiocytes. And then in addition to the, these nodules filled with foamy histiocytes, there is a lot of background fibrosis too, right? See, a lot of fibrotic scarring going on here. And so this would have been a large, probably multi-nodular area on the, the extensor surface of the elbow or the knees. 
I think they can also occur on the buttocks. So this is a tuberous xanthoma, okay? Tuberous xanthomas are large, not multinodular uh, sheets of xanthoma cells with variable amounts of fibrosis depending on the age of the lesion, and they tend to arise in those extensor um, uh, elbow and knee sites and um, are often associated with um, uh, lipid abnormalities. I think uh, I had to write it down. Familial dis-beta lipoproteinemia 3 is one of the classic ones, but there are a variety of other lipid um, uh, systemic lipid abnormalities that can, can produce uh, tuberous xanthomas. And these patients do, I believe, have a risk of peripheral vascular disease. So it's important, again, to make sure they get worked up and, and that their lipids get managed. Um, so this is a good example. And I have to say, probably because these get recognized clinically, um, and I think they maybe are only removed when they become symptomatic. I rarely see these removed. I, I, I don't think I have any good examples, maybe one in my entire collection, just because I never end up seeing them removed. So in, in any case, now you've seen one. This is a really good example. All right, guys, I think that thank was thank it. So much. And uh, thanks for thank your patience you. with the uh, technical issues. And thank to everyone you. watching online, have a great day and uh, a great weekend.